Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much for taking the time out of your busy schedules to join us in this webinar today. My name is Iris Emma Leroy. I'm an Associate Professor of Geriatric Psychiatry at the Global Brain Health Institute at Trinity College Dublin. And I'm one of the directors of the Dementia Academy, which aims to support the knowledge and practice of frontline clinicians. So this is a very interesting time, as I'm sure you'll be aware. This week, researchers at the University of Oxford have begun testing a COVID-19 vaccine in human volunteers. So we'll be very interested to see how that works out. But this has been a challenging time for many clinicians, and I think there've been a number of phases that we've, we've moved through over the past few weeks. I think initially, many people were quite shell-shocked and immobilized. Clinics were being canceled. Our patients weren't being seen. And then we moved into the, the scurrying around and the, the kind of muddling through phase, really addressing all the urgent issues. But now we're starting to address the less urgent but extremely vital aspects of a patient's care. And we're in the information gathering stage and starting to put action plans in place. And I think our job here today is to try to help you make sense of some of that emerging information of which suddenly there's quite a lot. What we haven't done yet is to start moving into the reflection stage and correcting what we're doing. But hopefully over the next few weeks, we'll be able to do that. So our goal today really is to ensure that the information we share is accurate and practical and meaningful. And the reason for doing this, of course, is because time is in short supply. Information is now burgeoning when initially it was scarce. Clinicians are facing new clinical scenarios and we have to figure this out together. So I'd like to just introduce the panel. If they can each just say hello. The first panelist is Dr. Karen Harrison Denning, who is the head of research and publications at Dementias UK. And she is an admiral nurse who's been working for many years on the front line with people living with dementia and their families. Hello everybody. Next is Diana Verguin a medical social worker who has been working for many years in the memory clinic at the Mercer's Institute for Successful Aging at St. James's Hospital, Dublin. Hello everybody, good afternoon. Then there's Dr. Ronan and Cueve, a consultant geriatrician at the Mercy University Hospital in Cork. Hi. Dr. Gregor Russell, consultant psychiatrist at Brown NHS Care Trust. Hello everyone. And Dr. Clara Dominguez Vivero, an Atlantic Fellow for Equity and Brain Health from the Global Brain Health Institute at Trinity College Dublin. And Clara will come in at the last 10 minutes, giving us an overview of the current literature that's starting to emerge and helping to signpost us to some key information that uh, has been posted already online. So I hope you will find that helpful. Hello, everyone. Um, So what we've done is looked at some of the questions already and tried to divide it into three key themes. The first theme is addressing some issues that have been emerging on the front line in terms of clinical care in memory clinics and with people living with dementia. The second theme is about adjusting and adapting our clinical practice and uh, ways of working to adapt to the new scenarios. And in the last section, the last few minutes, we'll start looking at some uh, crucial questions and difficult decision making. So I'm going to jump right in with the first question, which I'm going to ask Ronan to address. And um, the question is this, is a person with dementia at greater risk of COVID-19? Early guidance was that, quote, they are at no more risk than they would be with the usual winter flu. Do you mind just talking us through that issue, please? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a difficult question because it's, it's complex. Um, I suppose from a biological perspective, there's no evidence to suggest that people are at greater risk than they would be with other types of infectious diseases. Um, people with dementia um, often have a lot of comorbidities that go with that, um, and that does make them more vulnerable to other conditions. And we know from the evidence that's available so far that people with hypertension, existing cardiovascular risk factors, that they're more vulnerable to adverse events with the virus and have increased mortality. Um, we know that dementia is a complex condition. There are lots of different subtypes of dementia. Um, the overlap with cerebrovascular disease is significant. And therefore, one would expect that those patients are certainly more at risk with um, 
with COVID-19 than they would be with um, your typical annual influenza. Um, but there's other things about um, COVID-19 as well that make patients with dementia more vulnerable. Um, and part of that is the social isolation and the, um, the social distancing measures that we've introduced in order to uh, suppress the curve and, and try to reduce the burden on, on the healthcare system. Um, people with dementia, particularly those who live alone, and there's a significant portion of people with dementia who do live alone, their ability to socially isolate is significantly reduced. Um, this can put a lot of pressure on, on them and their families. Um, I suppose we know this condition can be asymptomatic for a lot of people. There are probably a lot of asymptomatic carriers who are, are walking in the community that maybe you know, older people with dementia may come in contact with if they are out of their own homes. Um, and I suppose, again, it depends on the setting in which the patients um, are, are, are in, people in nursing homes again. The need to social isolate in that kind of environment um, makes it very challenging. Therefore, the risk of transmission is probably higher in this, in this population. And we're seeing that in, in real life practice as well, that patients in healthcare settings, um, those in nursing homes in particular, are far more likely to um, contract the disease than they would be uh, in other settings. And again, it partly reflects the fact that people with dementia don't have that ability to, to social isolate. Their awareness um, of maintaining social distancing is certainly less uh, so in that sense, they probably are more likely to contract COVID-19. Um, the fact that they're older generally, um, as most um, age, is, age is certainly associated with dementia, they are more likely to have adverse events with it and, and the significant degree of comorbidity that comes with aging and with, with dementia as well. But that does make them more vulnerable to it. So in that sense, I suppose the answer to the question is, yes, they, they certainly are at higher risk than your, your average um, patient. Thanks very much, Ronan. I'm going to direct the next question to Gregor. Several frontline carers, particularly in care homes, are reporting that they're struggling to manage the so-called challenging behaviours, usually manifesting as agitation and aggression. And the growing reports of the rising use of antipsychotic medication for a number of reasons. Could you please address this issue for us? Thanks very much. Hey, well, interestingly, um, that's not been the experience generally in Bradford where I'm working so far. When the COVID situation emerged, we anticipated we would have very severe pressures on our inpatient units for this reason. That, um, because it certainly would make sense that people who would be prone to um, have experiencing agitation um, are not able to access the normal uh, ways they would use to, to manage that, or those ways may be less available. So we would anticipate there would be an increased level of agitation and perhaps other behaviours going along with it. While there may be some of that, it's not been to the extent that we'd expected. And in fact, our wards are largely uh, emptier than they have been for many years, because we've been very keen to to be moving people to the risk of them remaining in hospital and somewhere where they may be vulnerable to coming into contact with COVID. Um, nevertheless, I think, I think this is something we can anticipate, even if we're not seeing it. And I would say it's that the normal frameworks that we use for these situations still apply. So we want to be doing a thorough assessment of the behaviour and try to understand why it is coming about in that person and looking at a range of dimension, uh, their, their physical status in other areas, looking at their um, the environment and whether there's been changes in that have provoked the change, uh, and looking at how people are interacting with them. Um, everyone uh, involved in caring will be experiencing more stress themselves. Is there something about the way that the, the carers are, are changing their way of interaction that could be perhaps not helping the situation? Um, and, and looking to see if there's something can emerge out of that assessment that will allow an understanding of the behaviour and will come up with a solution that may be put in place that doesn't involve immediately going to antipsychotic medication. We always, you know, the, the, there are some circumstances where we do have to use antipsychotic medications, um, but we're always kind of very wary for the, the well-rehearsed reasons. We know they don't work very well for these presentations and we know that they can be harmful and those still apply now so there's no reason to be turning to these solutions earlier because they're not going to be more effective now than they would be in normal situations. Um, so 
there will be circumstances where antipsychotics may be needed, um, but um, an, an early recourse to them isn't really indicated and we still apply the normal rules of trying to understand what's causing the behaviour. I think there's an, addi an additional sensitivity and there's an emerging story just now that uh, in older people COVID may not be presenting uh, with the traditional symptoms of a cough and shortness of breath and that we should be very wary uh, of people who develop a, a sudden change in their mental status um, and in particular people with relatively mild to moderate dementia who suddenly become much more confused than we'd expect. Um, and I've had someone in my own caseload where this seems to have been the case. Uh, there's been no confirmation of, of COVID because testing's not been available, but there have been some then emergence of respiratory symptoms after they had become much more confused and someone that would normally be fully aware of who family members were and of their own home lost their orientation to that. Um, now, oh, we can't prove what's caused it, but there's a suspicion that this might be an example of where the COVID presentation was one of a change in mental state early rather than respiratory symptoms. Um, interestingly, they've done very well um, and they are now returning to a kind of baseline level of functioning. But in those circumstances, we'll be even more wary than normal about using antipsychotic medication because of the risks of sedation and making the respiratory status even worse. I think that's an extremely important point. Thanks, Gregor. So really keeping the possibility that the person may be COVID-19 positive and developing symptoms, masquerading as agitation and aggression or other behavioral disturbances is absolutely key. Um, Karen, I'm just gonna ask you the next question. If we assume that the, person, that the person's COVID-19 status is negative and they're physically well, would you mind just outlining some of the non-pharmacological approaches that could be adopted to manage agitation or aggression? Again, thinking about trying to um, not resort to pharmacological approaches. I, I would uh, concur with a lot of that that Gregor said, really. Um, quite interestingly, when we look at, uh, for example, the telephone helpline that we operate at Dementia UK, we sort of anticipated that there would be a, a spike in um, uh, family carers telling us that the person with dementia had been prescribed antipsychotics, and we're not actually seeing that, certainly not yet. But I, I think that what families and what professionals need to hang on to are, are simply what Greg is talking about, and that is um, be really mindful of, of um, the types of things that people with dementia communicate through their behaviours, um, through their non-communicative um, sort of inter interactions with us. And a lot of those will still stand in how to manage and to sort of problem solve uh, resolution to those, uh, to those particular states. What, what we've done at Dementia UK is that we're, um, there's a lot of information being put out there, as you said earlier, but it's, it's actually enabling people to access the right, you know, the key messages at the right time. So we've actually um, looked at, well, what are people with, uh, what family care is asking? What are care home staff asking? What are the frequently asked questions? And we're offering uh, specific advice around those. So if you go to our website, you can see how we've answered some of those questions. And largely the same um, sort of uh, non-pharmacological approaches um, still remain true in, in trying to problem solve or what, what's the underlying basis for this behavior? Is it new behavior? Is there a sign of possible physical ill health? Are there, are there reasons and rationales for why this behavior is presenting itself now? Plus also we're offering advice and support on if you do have a person with dementia who wants to leave the home, we, we give lots of advice on how a carer should manage that in any normal circumstance, but we're not in a normal situation. So we're actually helping them to problem solve. Well, try, try these different alternatives, uh, such as what, one way of um, often helping a, a family member to keep a person with dementia who lives alone in their own home is to put a notice on the door and say, you know, please, you know, don't go out, wait until such and such your carer comes. And what we're finding is working for some people is actually saying, don't go out, there's a really bad case of flu going around. 
Um, and it's actually using language that the person with dementia might understand or relate to. You know, there's no point putting a notice up saying that, you know, there's a pandemic and COVID-19 is, is, you know, going around speak in the language that they would understand. Um, so there's lots of different sort of nuances and strategies. Um, but certainly if we don't have the information on the website, any family member and, and indeed any healthcare or social care professional can contact our helpline and we would quite happily talk them through the issues. Thank you very much, Karen. And just to remind people that we'll have the listing of the websites and the helplines um, on the Dementia Academy and also you can go straight to Dementia UK and find that information. So very much related to that, Diana, I'd like to ask you, um, within the care home setting specifically or other environmental um, or other closed areas, how do you think that people can best manage wandering type behavior or simply people going about their normal business and wanting to go out going into other people's rooms coming into contact again it also raises this issue of pharmacological and and physical restraints that we've been hearing about particularly in the confined setting um i ideally you want to think that a care home uh, or a nursing home uh, which who, which has people with dementia already has implemented or has in place preventing strategies because preventing is going to be the first intervention that is going to work. As Gregor was saying, like the, no, the pharmacological approach shouldn't be the first one. But undoubtedly, if at two in the morning you have a resident screaming and hitting, music therapy is not going to work. So you, do, you cannot demonize one. It's, it's not one or the other. It's the two of them at the one time. Now, on, 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 on that approach, how are you going to manage a person who wants to walk about or walk around more than wandering, just to use a, a better term? Yeah. Um, ideally, I suppose, and that depends on the structure of the nursing home and the staffing, um, you, you should try and identify the, the, the cohort area, if possible, with a garden access, with an external access, keeping in mind that transient wandering into corridors is actually not associated with, with other risk and that no additional cleaning is, is required. Um, assigning, assigning staff to people and trying to have consistent staff and getting to know the person. Um, the first thing that you should be asking yourself as a clinician or you know, as, as a staff in nursing home, who is this person? What do they want? What's meaningful for them? What do, what do they like? and also being proactive, some sort of intentional rounding uh, to, to, I suppose, the, and the explanation of that being not waiting for an event to happen, but you being proactive and thinking, okay, every half an hour, every hour, I'm going to go around to every room, checking in everybody, reassuring everybody. Um, and that probably will bring good chances that, that those behaviors and those attitudes may you know, decrease and that uh, dementia should be easier to manage in this situation. Thank you very much, Diana. And it's also these, the extra challenges of staff numbers being quite low, and also residents often responding to the anxiety and uncertainty of the staff themselves, mm -hmm. of challenges. I'm just gonna shift the conversation a little bit to bring it into the memory clinic for today. And Ronan, I'm going to ask you, a um, number of people have been asking about cholinesterase inhibitors in the COVID-19 world. Are there any risks of using cholinesterase inhibitors? Now that may be for people who are already on them or about to start them or in the process of titrating up or if they become ill, um, continuing cholinesterase inhibitors. So we've got a number of scenarios there, but if you can just help us understand that a little bit, please. Yeah, I mean, I suppose the first thing to say is there isn't any great evidence behind this at the moment. A lot of it is anecdotal evidence, and I suppose our own experience of, of managing these patients in non-COVID times. Um, I suppose one has to appreciate first the overall benefits of cholinesterase inhibitors are relatively small, um, but if patients are established on them. There is concern about sudden withdrawal. There is concern about discontinuing uh, in relation to their ability to actually benefit from them in future if you do discontinue them. Um, I suppose from a theoretical perspective, from a pharmacological perspective, there are ways in which cholinesterase inhibitors could um, be harmful in, in the setting of acute COVID illness. Um, I suppose the most significant risk with cholinesterase inhibitors is um, cardiac side effects. And we do know that patients 
um, particularly those with existing underlying uh, cardiovascular disease are more likely to develop the cardiac complications of, of COVID. And, and it is particularly recognized that uh, myocarditis, so inflammation of the cardiac muscle, is associated with this condition. And that's unusual. A lot of you know, influenza, seasonal influences and colds don't tend to cause those sorts of, of symptoms. So that COVID is, is, a, is a different setting, uh, a different type of virus to the ones that um, we're probably more used to dealing with. Um, I suppose a lot of the symptoms of COVID in older people as well can, can mimic side effects associated with, um, with cholinesterase inhibitors, particularly GI disturbance is very common, about a fifth of people, particularly when they're starting off. So somebody is just recently um, starting to take a cholinesterase inhibitor, they may experience those symptoms. But again, they could be symptoms that might be actually COVID um, manifesting you know, with non-respiratory symptoms. Um, so it is important, I suppose, to consider if people are established on a cholinesterase inhibitor, whether the symptoms they have actually may not be related to it at all. And particularly if, um, if they actually are known to be positive, so if they're inpatients in the hospital setting, for example, to so not maybe necessarily rush in and to say, look, we're going to stop the cholinesterase inhibitor because those symptoms must clearly be related to, to the cholesterol inhibitor when, in fact, they may not be. Um, I suppose, you know, what has been discussed is whether titrating the dose down might be beneficial. Um, I suppose in practice, many patients are actually on sub-therapeutic dose anyway. They may actually be on five milligrams and not on the 10 milligram dose of omeprazole, for example. Um, so there, there is potentially some, you know, some logic in, in, in tempering, tempering down the dose. Um, I would be slow myself to stop it unless there was very clear side effects of it. And in practice, we've had a number of inpatients, older inpatients who have developed bradycardia um, and we have stopped it in those settings. It's unclear as to whether that was related to COVID or, or not, um, but I suppose it is something to consider. In an outpatient setting, I would be slow to be starting cold transistors inhibitor right now. In this time, I think you know, we have some time to wait. Um, again, because the benefits are, are relatively small, um, the side effect profile is relatively large considering the benefits that come with cholinesterol inhibitors. It is reasonable to, to hold off on initiating treatment at this stage. Um, again, it's a discussion to have with the patients to you know, kind of tease out if you can do that. Uh, I guess a lot of memory clinics are on hold at the moment, so it may be possible you know to do some of that discussion over the phone link in with their gps but actually you know a lot of these um discussions are probably going to wait in the practice i think for a lot of people on the uh, webinar today a lot of their outpatient clinics their memory clinics are cancelled so they're not having this discussion at the moment an alternative would be to start with mantine as well i suppose again a lower side effect profile in general and wouldn't have that kind of overlap with COVID type symptoms so it might be a more appropriate medication to start but i suppose at the moment, the evidence isn't there that you know COVID and cholinesterol inhibitors are, are contraindicated together. Thank you, Ronan. That's very helpful, and I think that's a particularly important question because as people and services are now starting to settle into knowing how they're managing acute COVID, these uh, what's considered less acute services like memory services are starting to to come to the fore again, and people are figuring out how to manage these these issues remotely. Um, Gregor, I'm going to ask you the next question. We've had several issues and questions about the diagnosis and management of new symptoms of depression and also emergence of apathy. Now, we talk a lot about apathy here in the Dementia Academy and how common it is in people living with dementia and generally underdiagnosed and unrecognized. But now we have the added complication of the COVID world. Can you just talk us through depression and or apathy, if you don't mind? I suppose the first thing to say when we're looking at depression in the context of dementia is is that it's well known that this is under-recognised and under-treated um, and that there are many people who would benefit from treatment even in normal times don't get access to it. But I think we've also got to look at the, the other side of that, which is we've got to be wary about, especially at the current time, potentially medicalising what may be a perfectly understandable reaction to what is for us a frightening situation. Um, so there's a balance to be struck there. And as always, how do we work our way through it? Well, you've got to talk to the person and you've got to do an assessment and try to get a clear understanding of the nature of the experience and whether this would fit with what we would understand as a picture of depression or whether it looks 
more like someone struggling to um, make sense of or or kind of adapt to the, the changes in their, their, their circumstances and environment. Um, we also have to bear in mind that our best evidence as to the effectiveness of standard treatments of depression in people with dementia is that, well, a very good evidence they work. The, the biggest, best constructed trial of two of the commonest antidepressants we use, mirtazapine and sertraline, failed to find any significant evidence of benefit. So that, that leaves us with a difficult position of what do we do to help and bearing in mind that access to psychological therapies may be even more difficult for this group than they would be at normal times. I think from my own experience, although the trials say that these drugs don't work, I've you know, come across too many cases where someone has been started in SSRIs and clearly been better afterwards. I think, there, to my mind, there is, there, you know, it happens too often for just um, people just improving spontaneously. So I think it's reasonable to offer people a trial of a well-tolerated, relatively safe SSRI. SSRIs are relatively well tolerated, but they're not innocuous and they're not side effect free. Um, so we have to always be careful of uh, the potential for dropping sodium levels and provoking side effects from that and also for GI upset. Again, some of these may mimic the symptoms of COVID. So just like with the cholinesterase inhibitors, we have to be a bit cautious there. Um, and as is always in the case of older people when we're introducing new medications, starting at low dose and increasing slowly would be much worse. Um, well, it's also important to consider other possible explanations. Um, and in particular, people who have become withdrawn, especially if it's happened over a relatively short space of time and they've become apathetic and disengaged from activity, that's even more under-recognized than depression would be. And going back to my last answer, this emerging story about COVID symptoms presenting perhaps in older people more frequently with non-standard symptom profiles. Um, so bear in mind if someone has changed over a, a few days from normal, I'd always be thinking could this be a delirium rather than depression. And then there's the, the changes in environment. So I, I had someone in clinic in the last couple of weeks where their family, um, for the best um, intentions had brought the person to live with with them thinking that it would suit them. In actual fact it didn't go well at all and the person's mood dropped substantially they became very upset very distressed um, and it could have been easy to say well in the midst of all this this looks like someone who's developed depression. The family actually tried moving the person back to their own home and the symptoms largely subsided they were much happier there. So so of course we have to have a high you know, index of suspicion for depression, because if you don't think about it, you won't ever find it. But also don't just assume that if someone's behavior has changed and they, they are sad, then that's depression. It's the, you know, just doing a proper clinical assessment, speaking to the person and trying to understand what the world feels like stood in their shoes. Uh, thanks very much, Gregor. And I think that leads very much into the issue that is really starting to grab headlines now, which is about loneliness and social isolation brought on by the current situation. Diana, can you tell us a little bit about approaches to loneliness and social isolation, which of course isn't unique to dementia, but in the context of dementia and the person who's in the caregiving role, this may have particular resonance. Um, it, it does, and I, I think the first thing to clarify is the concept of loneliness. Loneliness is within, you may be 24 hours a day with a person, so physically you're not lonely, lonely or emotionally you may be, and that is happening to carers all the time. Um, and, and loneliness, it is called, it is a killer. And I've, I've read somewhere that it amounts to smoking 15 cigarettes a day, whatever harm that does to you. Uh, so there have been different initiatives, like the Loneliness Task Force in Ireland, or the Campaign to End Loneliness in the UK, and a very recent stat saying that a fourth of the population in the UK now is feeling lonely. So what do we do with this? Um, I suppose if, if you start with hospitals, there are people who are isolators. They are sort of locked in their rooms. So how do you keep contact with those people? You have to get creative with this. And people have been really good 
in providing new, um, I suppose, technologies to do it. And some of the technologies, some of us who are parents have used them, a two-way baby monitor to be able to communicate with somebody without actually having to touch a button, a walkie-talkie, um, just this distraction activity, trying to keep them busy, and also perhaps in nursing homes, depending on whether isolation is needed. Um, at home, certainly the cocooning, um, it's, it's, it's probably doing more harm and good for many people. They are not let out. They are feeling the, the, the lack of, of contact. And we do need to make use of this hyper te technologic area that we have. Can you imagine COVID 15 years ago when we didn't have video calls? Um, I have read also recently that there is a significant difference in the response of the person listening to a voice versus listening to a voice and an image. And uh, yes, I do understand that we all get very anxious with technology, but there are some programs uh, which are fairly easy for video calling uh, and that people can use to communicate with their relations. And then pretty much every community has come together on befriending services, even the Irish Postal Service in Ireland. Um, you can, through their websites, request a check-in and when you think of it, who is better placed than the postman who goes every day to the door and knows who is there or who is not? Um, I, I, it's undoubtedly nothing is going to make up for this in, in, in the short term. But communities are doing so well in getting together and the neighbors coming out and talking over the fence. Um, and even people who weren't talking <laughs> to their neighbors because when they were younger, they were complaining that they were coming home too late or too drunk. Now are thinking, you know what, you are older now, so I'm going to reach out to you. And that's what we need to pocket on in these circumstances. Thank you very much, Diana. So communities coming together and there's been some tremendous examples of that. Um, I think we're going to shift the focus a little bit to the second theme, and that's about adapting dementia services and memory clinics, because again, as sort of the, the acute scenario of how we've changed um, the way hospitals work to address COVID-related issues is starting to fall into place now. The usual clinical concerns continue, and um, people continue to present with memory impairment and early complaints of cognitive change. So Ronan, would you just help us give some examples of memory services adapting and changing to the current environment, but likely we might have to think about remote working for a number of months into the future. Um, yes, look, I mean, I think for all of us, COVID-19 has changed the way we're practicing medicine. Um, it's, it's brought about a lot of structural changes to the health service. Um, and I think clinics, to some degree, have been left behind in this. Certainly, over the last month or so, uh, each country is at a different stage in, in, in the in the COVID crisis, and, and different healthcare systems are in different different sites are adapting in different ways. Um, I suppose, reflecting on my own experience in Cork, um, we um, we've begun that journey over the last few weeks. Um, the first, I think, month or so. Clinics were just cancelled and it was kind of felt everybody had to man the decks and be in the acute care setting. But I think look, as we've, we've said in this, in this webinar, you know, there is a growing recognition that people with chronic disease need this attended to. And while we want to discourage people coming into the acute care setting as much as possible, um, and indeed many older people themselves and their families, but older people themselves in particular, have really taken on that public health message. They really have um, recognize the importance of the need to cocoon, that they're actually very unwilling to come into, um, into the acute care setting and to, into clinics as well. Um, and I think most of us, I'm sure, will have experienced the fact that we're, we're, we're trying to make contact with people to bring them in because we feel they need to be seen and they're, 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 not really, they're not really open to that idea at the moment. Uh, that's new for us in healthcare, um, something that we're just not used to dealing with. Um, I think there's no question that we do need to adapt our, our model. So um, in the video we posted yesterday, which is up online now, we, we, we talk a little bit, I, I explore a little bit about how one could begin to configure a service to, to deliver remote or, or, or virtual memory clinics. And this is you know, something that is in the background and has been over recent years beginning to emerge. Um, I suppose the vanguard of this has been very much around cognitive assessments and doing those remotely. 
And, and some of it comes out of the practicality of doing it. If one can screen or do testing in advance, you get more time in the clinic to spend with the patient and you reduce a lot of the anxiety and other factors we know that feed into incorrect and um, unreliable cognitive testing when people come to a clinic setting. Um, I suppose older people are different. Lots of different patients will present uh, with different skill sets and abilities and, and you know, it's often age related that maybe younger patients in their 50s and 60s presenting with memory loss might be more amenable to this kind of remote testing um, and those with you know, maybe a little bit older, less tech savvy will, 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 will prefer the, the face-to-face contact. But I suppose needs must in this case. And there are other options as well. So beyond the kind of the, the online testing where you can you know, send somebody a link or they can log into a website and complete uh, you know, an online cognitive test, there are you know, telephone options. There's a wide variety of different ones available. You know, looking at this ourselves, you know, the number of systematic reviews have been done. But there's, there's upwards of 20 different uh, cognitive screening tests that can be done um, via telephone, including more common instruments such as the mini mental state examination that most people will be familiar with. Um, but there are challenges around doing you know, um, any sort of remote cognitive testing, particularly being able to control the environment, being able to ensure testing is, is, is rigorous enough. And then I suppose it's a challenge of what one does with the results of what somebody is trying to interpret those results without having that face-to-face contact, it is challenging. There's a lot of ethical issues in relation to whether one would just have memory clinics for the, the, the purpose of monitoring and, and you know, providing support to the existing diagnosis, or whether one really should offer remote um, diagnostic services to, to you know, make a formal diagnosis uh, remotely. And it, it, it is a difficult issue, even outside of COVID-19 issues. Um, it is something that I suppose some patients are looking for and other health centres and health services have no choice but to, to, to offer. So if you were working in a remote um, clinic setting, um, perhaps in you know, Australia or, or Canada or countries with you know, big geographic variations in their population, that, you know, rather than bring patients in for many hours to come to a clinic setting, that one could offer that remotely. Um, so I think at the moment it is something that's up in the air a little bit. I think telemedicine in general hasn't really been something that has been used in older persons' medicine up to now. Um, and that, that this gives us an opportunity, uh, this crisis, on, you know, there is a silver lining to it. It is that we have the opportunity to try out these new models. Um, other services um, have been using them for some time. But I think what are unique challenges to remote memory clinics, um, they're not insurmountable. And it, you know, looking at best practice, it would seem that you know you would offer a mixed hybrid type model, whereby you would offer um, some remote testing, remote support, telephone um, calls, and then after that, you would um, you would support people face to face by having that kind of more detailed assessment and offer them you know into you know more detailed investigations as they need them. Um, so for now, I suppose I can only speak from my own experience, but. It has been very much around the monitoring of symptoms. We are looking at, I suppose, trying to extend that a little bit and try to um, offer some remote cognitive testing for these patients uh, at home. Um, so yeah, look, I, I think it, it is something that perhaps, you know, this is a temporary crisis, it won't last forever. Um, but at the same time, it does give us the opportunity to kind of look to the future as well outside of COVID and how we will deliver um, memory clinics in the future. Yeah, I absolutely agree. Thanks very much, Ronan. And uh, I think Flowers posted a couple of papers on tele neuropsychology, specifically addressing this issue of cognitive testing remotely um, on the website so people can access those. But just keeping that in mind, Karen, I wonder very briefly whether you could touch on some key principles that we need to keep in mind thinking about remote clinics um, in the memory context, even going beyond the tele neuropsychology aspects. Yeah, I, I also want to point you in the direction of a, a short uh, presentation that I recorded to, uh, alongside Ronan's on how services are uh, having to work differently um, in light of COVID. And that, that's also the case in Admiral Nursing. It, we're quite lucky in a way in that we have quite a high skill set in um, the help the helpline nurses who manage uh, remotely using telephone, email, 
uh, Skype, whatever, to respond to uh, callers' needs. So what we've found is that when you look at working remotely, you have to very quickly get your staff group up to speed with how to manage it um, as best as they possibly can. And I think that um, particularly in, in case management in the community um, where you are no longer able to have face-to-face -face visits with a family, it's about um, how you interact uh, it, with a different medium and use very different um, skills and understanding of um, nonverbal communication to enable you, you and the carer and the family to get the best out of the situation. Um, and I think that also there is a, a sense of sometimes uh, alarm in, in nurses, in, in the staff, that at um, how can I effectively assess even, you know, something very basic as, as different risk aspects within the family home when you can't actually, you know, be there face to face and the hands on. And, uh, but equally, how can you manage and mitigate some of those risks um, when the, res the very resources that you would access within a locality are also locked down or, or disfigured or, or not sort of performing in a, in a, um, a functional way. But certainly I think that um, it, it's very, you know, it, it's key to use, you know, really employ your listening skills, it, particularly if it's a telephone intervention, but also be mindful of your interaction over such as this, a Zoom meeting. We have to use um, our methods of communication very differently to ensure that the person knows that we're listening, to enable them to give the best of a situation and to give the best information that they can. Um, and also perhaps more um, accurately in how we manage that interaction, that call, that Skype meeting very differently. Um, it, it has to have a beginning, a middle and an, and an end. And sometimes the end and how you round that up um, to, the, to the benefit of participants is really quite key um, so using skills sort of, um, you know, even if it's um, how your tone of voice, um, your nonverbal communications, um, mirroring how you can actually sort of reflect what they've said to ensure that you, you have heard to affirm what they're saying to, and to then sort of work through some potential solutions. Um, but please visit the, um, the film, the short film that both Ronan and I have, have delivered because it, there are some sort of tips and, and sort of possible options of how others might um, alter and develop their own services. And, and as Ronan and I agreed, there may be some things that we actually keep doing because they, 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 they work. And when you're put into a situation where you have to work differently, sometimes it opens doors and you think, why didn't we do that that way before? Um, so sometimes there's a, a, a silver lining. Thank you very much, Karen. So learning as we're going, but at the same time, there's a wealth of experience already there. So please take a look at the, uh, at the link on the website. Um, I think it's, it's absolutely essential when we're talking about dementia that we address care partners and particularly here in the wake of COVID-19, it's emerging that they're really much the, the invisible patient, aren't they? Um, last night I was on a call with um, clinicians from di multiple different countries in Latin America, all talking about care partner burden and stress, and it's significant around the world. Um, Diane, I wonder whether you can just talk us through that, particularly in the context of the changes in services, the loss of respite, care, closure of day supports, and so on. Um, one of the main issues that people are noticing is precisely the change in routines and routines uh, within routines we all do very well but the person with dementia doubly so because it gives them that safety that they know what is happening and at what, at what time uh, and suddenly all those routines or most of those routines could have gone not only as you're saying like people perhaps are not coming in to help them they are not going to a center or to a respite but also there are people at home who didn't used to be there 
there could be grandchildren at home, there could be people who have been let go from jobs. So it's not only their routines, but also the routines of the carer. Um, and care, not unlike parents, sometimes when, when I think myself, I didn't have my children to mind them 24 hours, seven days a week. Um, and, and it has to be, you know, you might as well say it as it is. Uh, carers probably wouldn't commit willingly to 24 hours, seven days a week, what you can reassure them first is that, you know, this will not be forever and that they've already done a good six weeks of COVID. Uh, so how to go on from here? Um, emotionally, it is very draining and there is no doubt about that. And emotions hurt inside, so you need to get them out. How to get them out? With, with the phone, with your immediate relations, but also with the professionals. And that's what professionals are for. Are for they lend a listening ear and they will help you pick the one thing and that's something that i often do in my job as social worker tell me the one thing that is more pressing now if you could change just the one and we focus our efforts on that one because smaller gains may be very significant they may seem smaller for us they are not smaller for them um, from there on establishing new routines is is the key so we used to have a routine. What are we going to do now? Um, establish a good pattern of activity, uh, morning, afternoon, and evening, um, which in, in a way is contradictory. You do want to have some organization and you would want to have a degree of flexibility. This is not about the outcome, it's about what you're, the process of what you're doing. Smaller activities, 10, 15 minutes, be creative and try to get a good balance between physical activity, cognitive activity, and a good bit of rest. And there are loads of resources out there um, to, to create a, a good balance, you know, and to test a few things and then create your own routine. Whether it is, you know, a little bit of exercise that you can do indoors and, and now it's been broadcast on the telly, so you don't need to... to <laughs> Um, depend on the internet for everything. A little bit of gardening, if you're lucky enough to have a, a, a back garden to go to, uh, music and it's invaluable um, use. Um, just your music memories, your BBC music memories, there are so many websites. Uh, and on those, the, uh, the, log, the Irish Dementia Office here has a good lot of resources. Dementia Services and Information Development Centre have put together activities. HUK, the Carers Trust, Carers UK, there are so many supports out there. And, and that's what, what people are needing. The practical advice, but also the emotional advice. Encourage them to talk and to ring and to say, you know what, you're doing a very hard job. And I must say, not every caring relationship is loving. And every time that I see your loved ones, it irks me. Because there are many caring relationships which are based on anything but love. And those people need the extra, extra support in this COVID. Thank you very much, Diana, that's extremely helpful. So you've mentioned many resources out there. So in just a couple of minutes, we're going to switch to Clara to help us make sense of all this information that's coming from all sides. But just very briefly, Karen, can you just signpost people to the short video you did on advanced care planning for someone living with dementia in our current COVID-19 times? Yes, there's been a lot in the media, um, health and social care press about advanced care planning and, and that never more than now is, is it sort of essential for everybody to talk about it really. Um, but yes, I, I just recorded a, a very short video considering some of the issues of advanced care planning in dementia in this current situation. So please go to that. But also again, I'd recommend that you go to the Dementia UK website where we've co-produced guidance and a template with people with dementia and families so that we've worked to use the the most appropriate language and the most appropriate format for them and that's free to download and again um, we've added some extra advice on advanced care planning in this current situation so thank you Karen. one of the questions specifically addressed doing this kind of work over the phone but I think some of the advice that you have already given and I um, can direct people to that. So we've slightly added a section about um, having difficult conversations such as advanced care planning in the medium of telephone so please do access it. 
Fantastic, thank you very much. Um, so thank you very much to all the panelists. We're going to switch now to Clara, who's going to show us some slides about information she's collected that's emerging, starting to emerge um, regarding dementia and COVID-19. And ho she hopes to add to this as information emerges over the next few weeks. So Clara, if you can share your screen for us, please. Yes, hello everyone. Um, I tried to go for the most interesting things. I found the, the truth is that there is a lot of information already there, but not so much information specifically uh, focused on dementia. So I tried to organize it that I'm going to be very brief just to give you some hints. So regarding clinical care, um, I think this paper in The Lancet is a very good introduction on the particular challenges of dementia care during COVID-19. And then I found this very interesting uh, online resource, this video from the Alzheimer's Disease Chinese Association about how to care about, uh, about dementia uh, during the outbreak. And I think it's very useful. It's just uh, 30 minutes and, and it's really interesting. Um, Regarding the particularities of elderly and older patients uh, and COVID-19, these two articles seem, seem to me to be very useful. Uh, the second one even includes psychosocial and public health considerations regarding these, these populations. And then um, the role of physical and rehabilitation medicine. I found this one very interesting for the aftermath of the outbreak. And they even remarked that uh, many patients of COVID-19, elderly patients, then after have to deal with a lot of consequences of deconditioning and also cognitive decline. So we also uh, have to be there for that. Um, going back to the conversation we already had about medications, uh, this is why I brought these cardiac and arrhythmic complications because they have a section talking about uh, possible effects of different medications on these uh, kind of complications typical of COVID-19. But then I found this, I think, amazing resource on how to optimize medication management in long-term care, uh, what uh, treatments uh, are worth uh, to keep, how can we uh, get them out if we need to. So I think this is very interesting and everything is online and for free. Uh, about adapting services, um, this, there's only one uh, paper reviewing how they adapted the ne neurology department for this situation in the Columbia University Irving Medical Center, but it's quite interesting and it's quite exhaustive in the information they, they give. And then the Journal of Telemedicine and Telecare, which is the first time I have to confess I come and I find this journal, but now it's very useful. Uh, so they review the telehealth for global emergencies and actually it has been used in different situations. So it's also a very good resource. I want to remark that the Journal of the American Geriatric Society is releasing a very uh, interesting material and this on the how to apply the MOCA online uh, and the link you can see down is uh, like a educational resource for doing this. Um, and then, well, some information about how, how to deal with uh, COVID in long-term care facilities. Uh, this one is very uh, schematic and easy to, to, to read. It has very useful algorithms. Um, if you are interested in the epidemiology on long-term care facilities, I think this one is the, the best that I run into. And then all these uh, on how to prevent outbreaks, how to protect the staff and um, people using the facilities and how to deal with asymptomatic and presymptomatic cases in long-term care facilities. I think they give very useful tips. Uh, regarding complex decisions, I didn't find so much out there, but these two uh, articles on the Swiss Medical Weekly, I think are worth taking a look to about palliative care and decision-making on palliative care on elderly in COVID-19. Uh, we also need to keep going with research regarding dementia. Uh, the situation should not stop us from doing that. And this is a position paper on what we should focus on during the situation regarding mental, mental health and some vulnerable populations. And then we also have these two very interesting ones on how to keep going with research in social distancing scenario and how we can keep programming uh, visits and, and tests for patients. 
Um, finally, these are online resources, first for professionals and then just two little uh, things for, for patients and caregivers. So this is, they have a lot of resources together um, from a more scientific point of view or informa informative point of view, less practical, let's say, but it's very interesting what they put together. And this one I found very practical. It's in Elsevier, it's like a hub of information and the way it's organized, it's really, really easy to look for things for professionals. They tell you what you, you should do, or for example, they have a section on what to say to patients in any of these uh, environments, so very useful. Um, finally, I also want to um, talk about this one because it's where I found the um, medication advice and I think they have very practical advice on interesting things regarding long-term care. And finally, for patients, um, well, there's a lot of, uh, fortunately, there's a lot of resources out there, Alzheimer UK and a lot of associations are putting very valuable uh, things for, for caregivers. Uh, in the website of Alzheimer Scotland, I found uh, useful videos that are really quite short and easy to watch about coping with the stress, being prepared if you have to go to the hospital or, or activities at home, also in Alzheimer's UK. And then in Ireland, um, there's a lot of information for caregivers, but also this uh, resource hub is like a PowerPoint presentation with a lot of links that, that, that can be very useful for for families and patients. All these resources will be put in the, um, in the website and I think it will be useful. And yes, then remember that life keeps going also for the elderly and people living with dementia. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Clara. That's extremely helpful having that all collected in such a, a clear way. I think will be a great resource for people. And, um, You've reassured us you're going to add to the collection as it develops in the next few weeks. So I think uh, there's nothing more to say than to thank our, our panelists. Sarah, I'm going to switch to you. If there's anything else you wanted to say about people accessing the webinar. Um, there's a couple of questions that have come in um, online, but we'll get back to um, if uh, those um, with written answers. Um, this will be um, edited and it will be posted on the website on Monday, as will the presentations for you to be able to access all the links and things. So thank you very much. We're going to try and run one of these a week. Um, I believe the next one's going to be um, next Friday. Um, but if you are interested in having these on specific topics, please do fill in the questionnaires on the website. Um, you'll have a post-course questionnaire once you close down out of the session today. But let us know what other information and what sessions you'd like to see as well, because we can adapt sessions as we move on um, for you. And we're going to have a mental health session um, in the next couple of weeks as well. So please do come back and keep an eye on the website for future courses. Thank you very much, everybody. We'll say good night and um, have a wonderful weekend.